The aging buccaneer finally got to prove its worth in British service following Saddam Hussein's 1990 invasion from neighbouring Kuwait. Though doubted by many due to its age, called obsolete by some, it sharpened the RAF air attacks to laser accuracy on Iraqi targets, successfully flying over 200 sorties, dropping 48 self-designated bombs and a further 169 spike for tornadoes. Though originally conceived as a nuclear-capable maritime attack aircraft flying close to Mach 1 at heights below 50 feet, the clouds of war over the Persian Gulf would send her up to altitudes of up to 29,000 feet giving the tornadoes a chance to deliver their precision-guided munition stores. Before we get any further into this video, let me kindly ask you to like and subscribe to help support the channel. On the 2nd of August 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Following this, NATO and her allies amassed a huge armada of coalition aircraft to begin the air war, before invading on the ground. Spearheading this coalition would be the United States, followed closely by Britain and then other members of the coalition. The RAF had originally planned for three aircraft types to be engaged in frontline combat strikes against Iraqi units. I've done a video on each of these aircraft apart from the Tornado GR1. The links will be in the description. Due to the RAF's tornadoes switching to medium level attacks, they needed laser guided bombs, and the only aircraft suitable for the role as a laser designator at the time was the Buccaneer. Although eventually two development tile pods were delivered during the conflict to the tornadoes, the Buccaneers were still needed to carry the proven paved spike pod. Now for some background information on the Blackburn Buccaneer. Originally conceived as a nuclear bomber, having its maiden flight in 1958 and joining the Navy in S1 form in 1962, which quickly evolved into the S2 model, delivered to the RAF in 1969. The Buccaneers served 30 years before the Gulf in British hands. A decade prior to the Gulf conflict, the Buccaneers saw new modifications, such as carrying the pave spike laser pod as well as flares and chaff. Now, let's move on to ordnance. For self-defense and due to the lack of guns, on the furthermost left pylon, the Buccaneer carried AIM-9Gs, However, these were upgraded to the all aspect and superior L version of the Sidewinder in the war. Later on during the conflict, after the threat that the Iraqi Air Force post was significantly smaller, the Buccaneers started carrying paveways on this weapon station. The next pylon along housed an AN ALQ 23E pave spike laser designator. On the furthest right side of the pylon, the Buccaneer carried an AN ALQ 101, known as the Dash 10 pod. This was an ECM electronic countermeasures pod to interfere with the enemy's radar. A spare pylon was left over, so when flying from the UK to Bahrain, it housed a slipper tank. However, it was removed due to asymmetrical weapons loadout. This pylon could sometimes be seen carrying a CBU. You may wonder why the RAF weren't using more sophisticated laser designating systems. Well, the GEC Ferranti tile pod was still in development, and the UIR only permitted the Tornado GR1 to carry it. Two pods were sent out to the Gulf during the conflict, however these were still under development, however far superior to the outdated paved spike pods the Buccaneers were carrying. Originally, because the crews were trained for combat over Europe, not the desert, they were trained to fly extremely low, classic Cold War RAF doctrine. The attack profile would run like this. Firstly, on the ground, the pod would be manually aligned with the aircraft's line of sight, the pod's crosshairs being aligned with the pilot's aiming mark, so the system and the pilot's sight were in sync. Secondly, now on a low-level attack run, the pilot would identify the target, placing an aiming mark on it. And once the navigator could see the target, he called Still circuit. Still circuit. Happy. And the pilot banked right, away from the target, whilst the navigator manually aligned the laser on the target with a joystick. Thirdly, the bomb-carrying aircraft, whether it be a British Jaguar, Tornado, or even a Dutch F-16A, would release their laser-guided bombs and hopefully, it would hit the target. This was the tactic used in the Gulf, except instead of 100 feet, it was conducted at 20,000. Less demanding, but still a challenging trick to pull off. The Dash 10 pod would work by deceiving enemy radar installations, which would guide the Iraqi surface-to-air missiles, called SAMs. Range jamming was used, where the radar of the SAM would lock the target, however the pod would disposition the aircraft's location by, let's say, five or so miles. So although it all seemed the same for the SAM operator, the radar was leading the missile to absolutely nowhere. 
So although the SAM operator thought he was tracking the aircraft and the missile was going to hit the aircraft, the missile wasn't going anywhere near the aircraft. In the opening days of Operation Granby, the JP-233 runway denial system required the tornadoes to fly extremely low level over enemy airfields. It was a risky job. The job had became extremely ineffective, which was due to two factors. Firstly, the airfields were vast, having multiple runways, unlike those which would be found on a potential European theatre war. Secondly, the airfields were heavily defended by anti-aircraft artillery and manpower. Several tornadoes ended up being lost to these low-level attacks, including one lost to an Igla 1E manpad. A rethink was in order, and tornadoes began flying at medium to high altitude, around 20,000 to 29,000 feet. Even though CCIP showed where the unguided bombs would explode when dropped from this altitude, they would still be blown off course by the wind. Therefore, they would need to be using laser-designated smart bombs to overcome this. On the 23rd of January 1991, the station commander of RAF Lossimuth received a phone call asking how quickly he could get a squadron of buccaneers to the Gulf. Three days later, the first two Buccaneers arrived in Bahrain. It only took 72 hours to get Buccaneers from 12 and 208 squadrons, plus 237 OCU. When the call was made to bring the Buccaneers to the Gulf, they were all scattered, 12 squadron being in Gibraltar, 208 being at St. Morgan. In total, 14 Buccaneers were prepared. There would be two backup aircraft kept in the UK, XV332 and XX893. However, at the end of the three days, the crews had prepared and six out of the 14 aircraft had undergone some vital modifications. These were the addition of Mark 12 mode 4 IFF antennae, new sets of radios, AN ALE 40 flare and shaft pods, and they were painted in the iconic golf pink camouflage or the ATRF alkali temporary removable finish with a Jolly Rogers flag captioned as Sky Pirates. At 4am on Saturday the 26th of January 1991, two pink buccaneers set off for Morag, Bahrain, accompanied by a TriStar tanker, taking nine hours in total. Following these two Sky Pirates, 18 air crew and 230 support crews left in a C-130 for the desert. Within the next few days, 10 other buccaneers would make their way to the desert. As soon as the Buccaneers got to the Gulf, they were thrust into the intense training with Tornadoes and Jaguars. Training ended on the 1st of February. The standard operating package for the RAF in the Gulf War would have been two Buccaneers accompanying four Tornadoes. Buccaneers lazing for the CBU carrying Tornadoes. They would be accompanied further by Coalition aircraft. E3 sentries would provide information on positions of enemy aircraft. F-15Cs would provide air cover. F4G Wild Weasels for Seed and EF111As for Electronic Warfare. The first mission Buccaneers were given on the 2nd of February were with Tornadoes, instructed to bomb the Al Samawat road bridge spanning the Euphrates. The crews flew out of Bahrain, flying on what became known as the Olive Trail tanker route. They took some fuel from a tanker and headed up to the bridge at 18,000 feet. The weather was pretty murky, however cleared up to blue skies as they arrived at the bridge, so the visibility wouldn't hinder the pave spike's effectiveness. The RWR, or on the Buccaneer, it was the ARI-18228. On the aircraft, were telling the crews that they were being tracked by Soviet-made Iraqi-operated radar, which would guide the surface-to-air missiles. However, no missiles were launched at them, and the overlooking E3 Sentry reassured the crews that there were no enemy aircraft up. The bridge attack was successful, also destroying some fiber optic cables embedded in the bridge, causing some communication disturbances for the Iraqis. Buccaneer navigators aimed for bridge's supports to ensure that the bridge fully went down. If two bombs were dropped, they would have to go off simultaneously to avoid the first bomb shockwave putting off the second one. Daily attacks were made on the bridges spanning the Euphrates, as well as oil refineries and other important facilities. A week into deployment, the first SAM was launched at a Buccaneer. The crew could see the white smoke of the missile as it launched towards them. However, USAF Weasel aircraft were quick to fire an AGM-88 anti-radiation missile at the site, killing the radar resulting in the SAM having no guidance. The Buccaneer crew could see this as the missile went straight up without making any adjustments towards them before exploding in a black plume of puff. 
Sam's posed a serious threat to all aircraft in the Gulf War, with numerous losses within the coalition, with the RAF also losing a few tornadoes to Sam's. One was lost in a combat package at around 20,000 feet, the tornado pilots then wanting to fly with the Buccaneers at 29,000 feet. Not too bad for an aircraft built to skim the waves. After Operation Desert Shield kicked off on the 17th of January 1991, the coalition ground invasion, Buccaneers started to switch their targets from bridges to airfields. Take a look at two waves which went to the third airfield that I just mentioned. I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce that, I'm going to probably butcher it and annoy some Iraqis, so let's just carry on. Though the first pair were unsuccessful due to the weather, the second pair found their jackpot and their claim to fame. The first aircraft of the second pair, XX901, which is the Pinky Buccaneer preserved at the Yorkshire Air Museum, was credited with the destruction of an aircraft with its CBU. The aircraft's registration was KAF-322, a captured Kuwaiti L-100-30 Hercules, which was captured by the Iraqis. The aircraft was left out in the open, and XX-901's navigator found it. He lazed and dropped a CBU. It struck the fuselage of the Hercules, though for some unknown reason it never exploded. However, at terminal velocity, the bomb would still have enough energy to cut the Hercules in two. The second aircraft I had the privilege to sit in last week at the fast taxi event held by the Buccaneer Aviation Group more on them in my previous video on the event. This aircraft was XX894, currently dressed in Royal Navy colours, however back in the 90s made her claim to fame. Her crew found a Soviet-made AN-12 Kub on the ramp and decided to laser bomb onto it. The AN-12 was filled to the brim with flammable jet fuel and received a direct hit from a Paveway 2 guided bomb. This time the bomb really set off, destroying the Kub in a massive firewall. However, when XX894 returned, she parked in the wrong spot, which was reserved for XX885. The crew's mixing the aircraft up and painting the kill marking on XX885, which was attacking a different airfield, not XX894. On the 17th of March 1991, the 12 Buccaneers that were deployed to the Gulf left from Iraq, heading back to the UK, escorted by Victor Tankers. The Sky Pirates arrived back in Lossiemouth in typical British weather miserable cloud. That concludes this video on the Sky Pirates in the Gulf. Following my previous video from last year, I think I could say that there have been some improvements, which is good. Please make sure to like, share and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.